to our uh, marriage seminar of uh, Chaffee Road Church of Christ. Uh, just uh, can't believe it's already the third night. And uh, so time flies when you're having fun, it's for sure. And, uh, and I tell you what, um, Brother David, uh, I think uh, you can give uh, John Gaughan a, a uh, or not John Gaughan, but uh, Burrish, Mike Burrish, a, a run for his money. He said it, it winds it clear out and everything, and it's, it's cleared out. So <laughs> anyway, I'd like to welcome everybody here. Um, I want uh, Brother uh, David McDonald is going to introduce our speaker, uh, Brother Victor Eskew, and then uh, better give you most time uh, possible. We'll go ahead and get started with our sing singing. Good evening. The invitation song after the lesson this evening will be Come to the Feast. And now we'll sing How Shall the Young Secure Their Hearts. Good evening. Thanks for being here tonight. I could be right or wrong just about the same amount of times as uh, Mike Burrish, I guess, and so could you. Uh, we, we've all got the same weather apps now, don't we? We've uh, introduced v Brother Victor uh, in, in different ways. Tonight I want to focus on a little bit different aspect of some things that he's done. I mentioned on Sunday night that he'd, he'd written a book, and the name of that book was I'm Thinking About Becoming a Christian. And, and Brother Victor, as, as we talked last night, writes for several brotherhood publications. Uh, the Gospel Journal that, that brother, our brother Walter is on that board. I think he's the treasurer of the board. And I think he's probably the one that supplies those for us uh, every month. Uh, and, but Brother Victor is, is a writer for that. But in addition to that, he has written articles for the Gospel Advocate uh, magazine and the Spiritual Sword magazine. And so uh, quite, quite a writer. And he's, he mentioned last night again the, the, the blog that he does on, on Facebook. That's not just a, it's not just a, it's a devotional is what it is. And sh showed us last night a good way to get started with family devotionals. Uh, the other thing that he's done is he has participated as a as a debater, and maybe you could just what what, what was the debate about, Victor? Pentecostal. Pentecostal, and, and where was that? Here in Jacksonville or Middleton, uh, Middleton Tennessee? So you know when you when uh, when you, we we do last leaders debates, but these you know that that's a little uh, eight minute speech. But but when you prepare for a debate, you've got to th those real ones. You've got to really be uh, on top of your game, and so uh, you know, you get you got to be ready for everything. And so uh, to do that is, is quite 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 something. And then he's also served as a missionary in, in several different places, uh, including uh, the Navajo Indian Reservation right here in, in, in the United States. Uh, he's also been to Guyana. He's been to South America and Central America and has conducted several mission trips in the United States itself. So he is, he is a, a world traveler uh, in, in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the minister over at Oceanside, and we're very fortunate to have him this week. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you so much for, for the day that you've given us. Father, we, we thank you for the, the church uh, your, that, that was bought with your son's precious. Father, as, as we continue our study this week and, and as, we, as we look to your word to help our marriages be better, Father, we, we thank you for, 
for Brother Victor's study and for his presentation and his, his knowledge in your word on how to make uh, the institution of marriage better for us. Father, we, we, we pray that, that as, as, as a married couple, we can, we can be on the same page, Father, and we pray that as, as we are different, uh, Father, and that as we have different goals, perhaps, as different families, we pray that all of our goal, our number one goal, will be to get each other and our families to heaven. Father, uh, that's a hard thing in this world, and we just pray that, that as, as we contemplate marriage, as we are married, that we will, uh, as he said uh, last night, that, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and, and we just pray that, that we will have the kind of relationship that you want us to have, Father, as husbands and wives and fathers and mothers. We thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to get to be together tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My dad is from, or was from, Crockett County, Tennessee. He grew up on a little farm there. And my mother, she was from uh, Camden, Tennessee. She grew up on a farm as well. And I told you about their educational background. Uh, neither one of them finished uh, four-year college. Uh, they moved to uh, Memphis because that's where a job was for my dad. And they bought a little house, $8,500 is what that house cost them. It had two bedrooms and one bath. And it had two bedrooms and one bath until my sister got old enough that we needed another bedroom. So uh, they put on another bedroom so she'd have one uh, by herself. And I uh, stayed in that house with my br brother sleeping in the same room with him until almost till I graduated uh, from the Memphis School of Preaching. So uh, I, I say that to say this, you hear about all these things, about things you get to do as a gospel preacher. And the way I look at those is I'm blessed to have been, uh, to be able to do those kind of things. Uh, you just never would think uh, that you'd be able to do that. And uh, I'm grateful to God to have done the things that I've done. And uh, I appreciate of being able to be here this evening and do this. Um, I was telling somebody that the things that we're talking about in these lessons are very practical information. And oftentimes when you're a preacher and you're preaching the gospel, um, maybe you get into a little bit of practicality here and there and some application. Uh, but for the most part, uh, we do what Paul told Timothy to do, preach the word. And uh, uh, trying to get into the practical stuff sometime is very, very difficult. And, uh, but the practical stuff oftentimes is the very thing that we need. Uh, and what we have to remember is this. We're talking about Bible principles, okay? But what we're doing is, is we're talking about how to apply those principles in our life and make those principles uh, come alive in our marriages. And hopefully uh, that's what we're doing this week. And I appreciate very much the opportunity to come and be with you. The title of the lesson tonight is this. Speak to be heard. Listen to understand. If I were going to retitle that, it would simply be this. Communication in marriage. One individual has said this, and rightfully so. Communication is, watch this, the lifeblood of every human relationship. Now notice, I didn't say it was the lifeblood of the marriage relationship, even though it is. But it is the lifeblood of every relationship that we sustain. Whether that be a parent with a child, whether that be a neighbor with a neighbor, whether that be a brother and sister in Christ with another brother and sister in Christ, whether that be an employer-employee relationship, it doesn't matter. Communication is the key to every relationship that we have. Good communication is the bridge that enables us to go between confusion and ultimately obtain clarity, doesn't it? Communication is probably the number one cause of most divorces today. It's amazing, isn't it? Now here's the wonderful thing about communication. It's a skill. It's not something that you're either born with or not born with. Communication is a skill. What do we mean by that? Well, you look up the definition of skill, it means this. An ability that comes from knowledge, it comes from practice, and it comes from aptitude. 
tonight I'm going to give you some skills that you can use in order to increase your ability to communicate. And the more you do them, the more you practice them, the more you go out into the world using those skills, watch this, the gooder and gooder and gooder you're going to get at talking to other people. Now that's terrible English, isn't it? But that's what's going to happen if we put these things into operation. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about some things. And like I told you last night, when we talk about them and I tell you this is what you need to do, you're going to go home and you're going to try this and you're going to say, man, this just feels kind of dumb. And your mate at first may look at you and say, quit using that stuff that preacher said to use. Because they're going to know exactly what you're doing until you get really, really good at it. But remember, the more you do it, the better it. I want us to start by talking about the seven elements in the communication process. The first element is what we might refer to as the sender. Right now, I am that individual, aren't I? I have a message, I have something that I need to tell you, and I am the one who is doing everything I can do to communicate that to you. I am the sender. Secondly, there has to be a message. I have something that I need to desperately communicate. It's a thought, it's a concept, it's a skill, it's a practice, it's something that I need you to come to an understanding of. And the message is totally different than the sender. The message can exist even though I, as a person who might be a sender, may know nothing about the message. Because communication is something anybody can learn from anywhere, isn't it? Thirdly, there is a receiver. Somebody who is going to get that message. Someone's going to hear about it. Somebody who's going to read it. Somebody who's going to see that message communicated to them. Now most of the time, those are the three elements that we think about in the communication process. A sender, a message, a receiver. But there's much more to it than that. There is the encoding process. I have to stop and I have to think, okay, here's what I want to communicate to them. And how am I going to do that? It might be words. It might be by a picture. It might be by a chart. And guess what? It might be that I simply communicate my message through body language. But I have to be able to encode that message so that it can be communicated to you. Now, once that message has been sent forth and you are sitting there as the receiver, guess what you have to do? You have to decode the message. And sometimes that decoding of that message can be a very difficult process. Is what he just said what I really think he said? I see people all the time when I preach. There's also a relationship that exists between the sender and the receiver. It might be a very close-knit, intimate relationship like that of a husband and wife. Or it may be a relationship where two individuals just barely meet in passing and yet there's some communication that transpires between them. There's one other element that is in the communication process and it's simply this, the environment in which we're communicating. Sometimes we do our best in order to make the environment conducive to learning, don't we? That's what we've done tonight. I stand here, I've got a microphone, I've got PowerPoint, you're sitting down there, you're quiet, you're not able to talk. Well, I guess you could if you wanted to, but you ain't supposed to. At least that's what we do most of the time in the church, don't we? But you see, we create environments. And sometimes we can't create the environment, can we? Sometimes the environment is created for us, and yet we still need to communicate. Now most of us would think, you know, all that stuff, yeah, I learned that way back there in a communication class. 
But we forget something and it's this. All that has to happen is just for one problem to arise in any one of those aspects of the communication process. And guess what? Communication can be completely destroyed. Let's look at some things. Can problems develop as far as the sender is concerned? Absolutely. Sometimes a sender may have what we refer to as low intelligence. Little babies are born into our houses. We bring them home after two or three days and they are just as little as they can be and guess what they can't do? They can't say a word. They're just kind of dumb. I don't mean that bad, but they just are. They haven't been taught anything, have they? And guess what mom and dads have to do? Mom and dads have to learn new languages. They have to learn baby language. They have to learn grunts. They have to learn groans. They have to learn the different kinds of cries, don't they? And it's amazing to me how quickly, especially moms, pick up on that stuff. Oh, he ain't hungry. He's hurting somewhere. Or he ain't hurting. He's just hungry. Okay, they just pick, they know from the cry. But sometimes it's very difficult. You take that baby to a doctor and guess what the baby can't do? The baby cannot communicate to that doctor what's wrong and where he's feeling the pain and the anguish. So it's very difficult when there's not much intelligence involved with regard to the sender. How about this? What if a sender is not feeling very well? I don't know about you, when I'm not feeling good, especially if I've got the flu or COVID or something, I say that because my brother just called me and said he's got it. He's okay. He's almost too ugly to get it. I'm just kidding. If he's here, I'd say the same thing though. But if you don't feel good, you don't want people talking to you, do you? And if you do talk to somebody as the sender, it's very short, very brief, just leave me alone or whatever it is. But if we're not feeling well, that can cause problems. What about this one? What if we don't know the language? Several years ago, I was privileged when my mom was alive. She took me on a trip to Greece. And we did the footsteps of Paul over in Greece. Now, the problem with it was this. When you get over there, there are some places that know English. But there are some places that you go, and guess what? They know no English. Me know no Greek. That's a problem, isn't it? And I'm in their country. So I go and I buy something. I go to the counter, and I have my money there. And you know what I do? I just put it all out of my pocket. I just put it on the counter. And I just trust that that individual gives me the right change back, don't I? The problem is not with him. I'm in his country. He knows his language. The problem is with me. I don't know how to communicate with him because I don't know the language. So there can be problems with the sender. Well, what about can there be problems with the message? A message can be lost when it's sent, can it? You ever type someone an email, send it? And you wait for a day or two or three to get a message. And finally you see the person. And you say, hey dude, I sent you an email. You know what they say? Never got it. Not a problem with the receiver. Not a problem with the sender. The problem was that the message got lost in communication. Sometimes we only partially communicate, don't we? You ever been driving down the road? talking on the cell phone, and all of a sudden you just kind of lose service. Or maybe it's real crackly service, and we start doing all that telephone talk. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? And finally you pick up the service again, and you have to go back and you have to repeat the last 20 minutes because that person barely heard anything that you had to say. Problems with the message, isn't it? I communicated it well. My receiver was fine. Problem was with the message. Have you ever sent something to the wrong person? I had somebody today send me a text that was not for me. Fortunately, it was a sweet text. And fortunately, I didn't learn anything that I wasn't supposed to learn. But one of our members was, 
had texted me something and they were going to text back this individual who was sick and they meant to text that back to the sick person. They sent it back to me. I told them, I said, you got Vic. But you see, the problem was the message was sent to the wrong person. Well, what about the receiver? Well, a lot of things can happen there too, can't there? Lack of intelligence. Have you ever thought what it would be like to be a 911 operator? You're sitting there on the end of that line, you pick up that telephone, and all you hear is a little three or four year old going, It's daddy! It's daddy! And you say, What's wrong with daddy? And she responds saying this, It's mama! It's mama! I thought it was daddy. You see, I don't have any intelligence about what's going on over there with her. It could be that mom is sick and dad is sick. It could be that mom and dad have been in a car wreck and both of them are injured. It could be that mom has hidden herself in a closet and dad is trying to bust through the front door as an abusive husband. But you see, I don't know that as the receiver because I don't have that information. Sometimes the receiver doesn't feel very well. And sometimes there's just some cultural differences, are there not? I heard of a preacher, he went over to England. And he was preaching over there in England and he was talking about a ball game. And he says, during that ball game, the crowd stood up and they just rooted and rooted and rooted for their team. And he's looking out over the audience and their faces were just weird. He knew something wasn't right. He didn't know what. He just knew something wasn't right. When he got through with his sermon, he got called over to the side and he says, Hey preacher, you know you were talking about rooting for the home team? He said, yeah. He said, that little word over here means to make love. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. He didn't say it once. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder there were some goofy looks on some faces out there. And guess what it was? It was just the way culture uses different terms. He just didn't know that. But you see, it causes problems in the communication process at times. What about encoding? You ever talk to anybody with poor grammar? We've got a lady in our congregation. She's the sweetest lady. She's from the Philippines. And guess what I have to do? Man, I have to listen to her. And sometimes I have to say, what did you say? And she'll say it again. And sometimes I have to ask three or four questions before we ever get on the same page. And it's all because grammar isn't very good. She can even type you a message. And you'll get that message and you go, what did she just say? And you have to go through that typing this time. Just poor grammar. How about this? Getting angry, yelling, screaming. That's not going to help our message, folks. When we start yelling and screaming, guess what the other individual does? They just shut down, do they not, for the most part? Or they get so focused on the anger and get so focused on the yelling and screaming that they don't hear anything else, do they? Two, there can be tones and inflections. That can be inappropriate. We want to say one thing, and yet our body language says something totally different than what we really want to communicate. And we're confused by that. Sometimes it's difficult to decode, isn't it? If you don't understand the words that another individual uses. One of the things they told us in preacher training school is this, don't you dare use a bunch of big words in your congregation. Folks, I'm not going to stand up here and preach to you about soteriology, ecclesiology, angelology, eschatology. Why would I want to use those kind of words? First thing I have to do is stop and, de and define every one of them, don't I? What in the world is he talking about? It does you no good. It does me no good whatsoever. 
So sometimes we don't understand the words that another individual is communicating to us. I run into that all the time at the doctor's office. Don't you? This boy is as dumb as a rock when it comes to medicine. Now my wife's a nurse at the VA. She's pretty smart in that stuff. I'm taking medicine and I can't even say the names of the medicine. I don't even really know why I'm taking it. Doctor said, take it, I take it. I'm supposed to feel better and live forever. Go to the doctor, what you taking? I don't know. Starts with an F, it ends with an E. That's all I know. Isn't that amazing? There's, there, there's not much communication between me and doctors and nurses. Not unless they really go slow with old Vic. So Steve Cody can be hard. How about this one? Part, but not all of the message. Have you ever watched a game show like Family Feud? There's those two people standing there and they're about to get asked a question and they got their hands down there ready to hit that buzzer, don't they? Oh, Steve Harvey doesn't get three words out of his mouth and one of them goes, hits that buzzer. He doesn't even know what he's about to ask. And he just has to what? He just has to guess what he's going to say. Sometimes they guess good. Sometimes they don't guess so well. But you see, sometimes if you just get part of the message, you have no clue what's going on, do you? How about this one? Assumptions and conjectures. Anybody ever said something to you and you just start assuming some things? Your boss walks by you. I need to meet with you in my office in about 15 minutes. Uh-oh. I'm, I'm fired. Pink slip. Oh, Sue, she's already been in there talking to him about me. Whatever. We start all these assumptions, don't we? It's easy to do. How about this one, relationship? I want you to listen to something. This is interesting. The closer the relationship, the more difficult it is to communicate. Isn't that amazing? You wouldn't think that, would you? But that's exactly the truth. When you walk into a convenience store, do you have much problem communicating with the person? I don't. I walk in. Hello. Glad you're at Daly's. I walk over. I grab a monster drink or something. Bring it to the counter. How are you? I'm fine. Just this drink, please. That'll be 346. Thank you. Have a good day. Zero problems in communication. I understood her, she understood me, and you want to know why? Because we don't know each other. Do we? We just barely know each other. And there's very little communication that goes on between individuals who are not very close. So we ask ourselves, why is it so hard to communicate? Four reasons. Number one, because of the depth of the conversation. Though sometimes the conversations we have to have as husbands and wife, they go pretty deep, don't they? You ever have to talk to your husband about his spirituality? That's a deep conversation. You ever have to talk to your wife about one of your children and some of the problems that they're involved in at school or with friends? Those are deep conversations. It's not just superficial like a convenience store person, is it? How about this one? Usually in homes, there's a lot of emotions that are expressed, aren't there? You see, I feel free to express my emotions in my home more than I do out in public. And therefore, it doesn't take much, and it can just trigger the emotion, and I immediately express it. Whether it be anger, whether it be tears, whether it be selfishness, whatever it is, I can just express it quickly because I'm in a very friendly environment. How about this one? In our homes, there's a lot of self-interest involved, isn't there? I realize we're supposed to be in marriages that practice agape love. And agape love says, I always look out for the best interest of the other. Hogwash. Sometimes we do that. And many times we what? We don't. There are many, many times that I'm more concerned about my self-interest than I am about the interest of my spouse. And then fourthly, previous history. 
Guys, when I walk into Walmart, I don't have any history with those people in Walmart. You know that? None. Oh, now, over the course of time, we may get familiar with one or two of the workers. There's a lady at the Walmart that's there in San Pablo, and her name's Rita, and she and I talk all the time. This morning I went in, I hadn't seen her in about three weeks. We hugged each other. But it's not a relationship that has much history to it. Now, Kathleen and I, we got 42 years of history. That's a lot of history, isn't there? What? Some of that history is good. And guess what? Some of that history isn't as good, is it? And that history that we have behind us oftentimes impacts this relationship and the communication that goes on in that relationship. And lastly, there's the environment. There can be a lot of problems, can't there? Individuals can be distracted. Wives, listen to me. If your husband is watching the Super Bowl, don't talk to him. Now that may go the other way too. There was an old man at the Brooklyn congregation. He was 97 years old when we baptized him. I'll never forget baptizing him. He was so stiff at 97. When we leaned him back, it was almost like baptizing a board. He was that stiff. And the reason he was baptized was because his wife had died about two years earlier. And they'd been married for about 75 years. And he got to thinking, you know, my wife was a Christian. My wife has died. He knows where she was going eternally. And he says, if I don't do something about my soul, he said, I will never be with her again. And he just could not face that. So his daughters brought him down to the building and we baptized him into Christ so that he could go back and be with his wife. After his baptism, I went over to visit him one day, and he was just laid there on the couch. His daughter was sitting in a chair not far from him. And I walk over to him to shake his hand. And when I reached down, first thing he said to me was this, Get out of my way! I looked at his daughter. She said, Sit down. She said, He's watching Jeopardy. And until Jeopardy is over, you ain't talking to him. I said, Yes, ma'am. So I said, I'm watching Jeopardy. And then I could talk to him. But you see, there's distractions. Jeopardy was his distraction that day. How about this one? Poor connections. We've already talked about that, haven't we? There's places where our cell phones don't pick up. How about this? A loud, noisy, echoing place. Marion's here tonight from Oceanside. She's heard me tell this. My daughter got married on December 2nd of this year. One of the things that a preacher asks oftentimes in a marriage is when the woman gets to the front, he'll say something like this, Who gives this woman in marriage? Well, I didn't want to talk to myself. Okay, because I was doing the marriage. And so I thought, you know, wouldn't it be kind of... Who gives this woman in marriage? I do. That just wouldn't look too good. So my brother was there and I told him, I said, Eric, you sit down close to the front. I said... When Lauren comes down, everybody will stand up. And when they sit down, you just stay standing. And you can say, who gives this woman in marriage? And I can say, I do. And then we can get on with the service. Now, wasn't that a pretty good solution? Well, this venue I had never been in. We had never tested the microphones. I didn't know anything about the acoustics whatsoever in that place. Well, the minute everybody sees the Bride, they immediately stand up, don't they? So we didn't have any trouble there. She gets down to the front, and the minister usually will say, everyone can be seated. So I did. It sounded like God was... Everyone be seated! And it just echoed through that building. And I thought, good grief, is this what they're going to hear for the next few minutes in this wedding, just echoing off the walls? And so here all this echo was going on. Everybody was seated. My brother was standing. And the first thing I did was say this. Who gives this woman in marriage? My brother looks at me and says, that's my part. <laughs> Sometimes the environment is not conducive to communication, is it? 
How about this one? Have you ever been somewhere you need to say something and there's a bunch of other people around? That ain't good, is it? You try to whisper and the other one says, I can't hear you. And so you whisper a little bit louder and you know Jane behind you is hearing everything because she's listening. And so you finally just got to get somewhere where you can talk. You see, sometimes we're in places where it's just not conducive to speaking. A lot of different problems. Guys, if you're having trouble in the communication process, one of the things you need to do, look at the seven elements. If there's anything going on in those seven elements that's causing a communication breakdown. Now, notice the title of this next section. How to listen. Now remember the title of our sermon tonight is what? Speak to be heard. Listen to understand. I'm starting with listening. Because if the 8 o'clock hour gets here, <laughs> y'all told me I can go to 10 if I want to. Okay, So I'm going to keep you to midnight like Paul did. See how you like that. <laughs> You'll tell me to finish at 7.30 tomorrow. Um, the biggest problem we have in all of our society today is there is not a soul on this planet hardly who knows how to listen. You know that? And I'm talking about counselors who've been trained to listen. I'm talking about psychologists who've been trained to listen. Psychiatrists who've been trained to listen. I'm talking about doctors and nurses and lawyers. In all of my time that I've been on this earth, I have only met and heard about three human beings who could truly listen to somebody else. Isn't that amazing? Oh yes, we think we listen. We don't listen at all. I do have a degree in counseling. That was one of my degrees from Ambridge University. And so they taught us how to listen. And tonight I'm going to do my best to teach you how to listen a little bit better. And guess what? If you brought my wife in here, she said, He don't listen too good. It's hard. It takes time. It takes focus, energy. And it takes doing it over and over and over and over again. When I was at the Memphis School of Preaching, we brought a man in to try to teach us how to listen because ministers should be able to do that. And this man that was teaching us, he would sit two individuals together and they begin talking to one another and they're supposed to be using the listening skills. Well, one of the boys was talking to the other guy and all of a sudden you could see that counselor, he says, hang on a minute. And the guy that was supposed to be listening, he got him out of that seat and he sat down with that young guy and started t talking to him. And guys, he's talking about a major problem that was happening in his home while he was there at the school of preaching. It got to such a point that the counselor had to finally tell, he says, guys, we can't continue this here. This is too personal. And me and this young man are going to have to talk about this outside of this. He was listening to that man. So the question we need to ask ourselves is how do we listen? Now, remember what I told you. Yesterday, I'm going to tell you to do some things. And you're going to think, these are about the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life. And when you start to use them, you're going to feel like a baby. And when you start to use them, your mate look, will look at you and say, I know what you're doing. That's okay. Because remember, the only way to get good at it is to what? Keep doing it. So how do we listen? Now let's look at this verse first. Are we supposed to listen? At least to God, aren't we? Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be what? Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. You go home tonight and you look at that verse in its context. Verse 18, he's talking about our receiving the word of truth. And when you and I receive the word of truth, what are we supposed to do? Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Guess what you can do? You can use the skills 
that I'm teaching you in listening to the Almighty God as He talks to us through His Word. It's a relationship, is it not? So how do I listen to my mate? My mate comes in and my mate says something and I want them to know that I'm really listening. Here's the, there's going to be four steps in this, okay? And the first one is this most simple, easy thing to do. Watch this. Repeat the very words that they just said to you. Husband walks in. Man, it was a tough day at work. What's the wife supposed to say? Just repeat his words back to you. Oh, so you've had a tough day at work today? Now that sounds stupid, doesn't it? It's not dumb. You want to know why? The very minute that person hears me say that, you know what they know? They know I just heard everything they just said. You want to know how communication oftentimes goes? Something like this. Man, I've had a hard day at work today. Oh, you ain't had no hard day. You should have been in this house with all these kids. That's a hard day. Uh Uh-oh. Communication has just come to an end. Hasn't it? This is exactly what we do, folks. I promise you we do. We don't listen. You make up your mind right now that I'm going to listen. And I'm just going to say back to that individual exactly what they say to me. Now, here's what I tell individuals. Don't start at home. Okay, don't go home tonight and start repeating everything your husband or wife says. You will drive them bonkers tonight. Okay, don't do that. Tomorrow when you go to Walmart and you're talking to someone, ask them a question. How's your day been? You know, it's been a great day. Just repeat that back. So it's been a great day. You want to know what you start doing? They know you just heard them. So guess what they're going to do? They're going to start responding back to you. You know what? Yeah, it's been a great day. I've been here 10 years now. Uh Uh-oh, I just learned something that they didn't tell me a while ago. You've been at this store for 10 years? I just repeated back what they just said. Yep, all my other jobs before that, I was maybe a year, maybe two years. Didn't get along with anybody, didn't get along with my bosses. Here, I, I just love my job. Have you learned some things about this person? Isn't that something? All because I did what? Repeated something back to them. Isn't that amazing? Now, see, they don't know what I'm doing. They just think I'm what? That I'm listening. If you're here with your mate and you go home and start doing that tonight, they know that you're doing that. Don't they? You just quit repeating that stuff. That's just what the preacher said to do. That's why you got to learn quickly how to do the second thing. Paraphrase back to the person what they said to you. I'm going to say back to them exactly what they said to me just using what? Different words. Man, I've had an awful day today. So your day's been long and hard today? That's kind of what awful means, doesn't it? You may know your husband worked eight, ten hours today. You may know the conditions at work have been kind of tough lately. So it's been a long, hard day. He said it's been awful. Yeah, it's been an awful day. You just won't believe it. One of our managers quit and one of the best workers quit online today. Uh Uh-oh. It wasn't that the work was so bad. It's what happened to the employees that was so bad. You've learned something, haven't you? What if you just told him, you ain't seen nothing unless you've been in this house raising these kids? He'd just shut you down. You wouldn't know a bit more than a goose. Anything about what's going on in his life. Communication is all about peeling an onion, folks. That's what it's about. Here's what's interesting. Hardly any of us communicate to another individual exactly what we want to say the first time. Isn't that something? We think we do. We try to, but most of the time, we do not. So now, it's the responsibility of what? Of the hearer to try to peel that onion back to get to the very core of the communication. Now that leads to step number three. Listen for feelings. 
Listen for feelings. And verbalize those feelings to the individual. Husband walks in. Man, that old Joe. You know Joe, don't you? I could just wring his neck. Uh Uh-oh. Doesn't sound good, does it? Now, if you just repeat what they said, oh, Joe's giving you some problems, you want to wring his neck? What does it sound like? Sound like he's disgusted, disappointed, angry with Joe, doesn't it? So that's all I need to say back to them. So you're kind of angry with Joe today? I didn't repeat back the words, I repeated back the what? I repeated back the feeling. Folks, that is a major step in the communication process. Did you know that? Because now I've gotten past the facade and now I've gone deeper into the core of that individual. Now they really know what? I'm listening to everything they're saying, including their what? Including their feelings. Let me ask you something. Do your feelings matter to you? I'll guarantee you most of us would say, yeah, my feelings matter to me. What if his wife says something like this? So you're pretty angry with Joe and you just like to strangle him to death. Yeah, I'm angry with him. But I ain't going to strangle him. He's my best friend. Uh Uh-oh. A while ago he said he was going to kill him, didn't he? I was kind of worried. I thought I was going to have to call somebody. Okay. But now I know he's just upset with Joe, isn't he? Yeah, Joe was supposed to have something major in this project at work. And guess what? He said he didn't have time last night to get that done. So you're upset with Joe because he didn't get part of that project done. Because he said he had something else he had to do last night. See, I've just paraphrased, repeated, and touched the feeling, right? Well, guess what he's going to do? He's going to keep talking to me, isn't he? Because I'm what? Because I'm listening. Folks, listen to me. People will keep talking to you as long as you'll what? As long as you'll listen. If you don't believe it, go into a convenience store and start trying this. You may be there 10 or 15 minutes. And you'll learn some mess about some of them people you wished you'd never learn. And you'll quit listening. (laughs) You learn to listen and the world will come to you. You know that? Notice this last one. Paraphrase the words and verbalize the what? And verbalize the feelings. Now watch this. Listening for feelings. The most important thing in communication is to listen to what's not being said. Isn't that amazing? All I want to hear is what? All I want to hear is words. No! I'm not as deeply concerned about your words as I am what's behind the words. Notice this. Don't focus on the words. Listen to what? Listen to understand. See, I want to go beyond the words to the what? To the heart. That's what I want to do. Let's look at an example. Child walks up to mom. Mom's laid down the law. You failed that test? And because you failed that test, you are not going anywhere with your friends this weekend. Ah. Well, I just hate you. And I wish you weren't my mother. Oh, mother is devastated. Isn't she? Devastated. She can't believe little Susie would talk like that. So she says this, oh no, you know you don't hate your mother. I'm a good mother. And I do all kinds of things in order to take care of you. Ain't that what mama say? And you know what the kid says? <laughs> I do hate you. I wish Susie's mother was my mother. Now mom goes into her bedroom. She's crying. Wait until daddy gets home. Unbelievable. Happens all the time. You want to know why? Because mom's listening to what? 
She's just listening to words. That's all she's listening to. Quit listening to the words all the time, folks. Listen to the what? Listen to the feeling. Child, I hate you. I wish you were my mother. What's the emotion? It's anger, is it not? That's the emotion. Don't focus on the words. Focus on the feelings. I know that you are angry as you can be with me right now. Right? Because you can't go out with your friends for the rest of this weekend. You've just tapped into her what? Into her emotions. And you want to know what she may be mad about? May have nothing to do with you. Yeah, I'm angry. I should have studied harder for that test. And I didn't, and I failed it. Now who's she angry with? Mama thought she was angry with her. She's not angry with Mama. She's angry with who? She's angry with herself because she didn't do what she should have done. Isn't that something? You just try to get past the words into the feelings. Now, feelings, guys, did you know there's thousands of them? There's thousands of feelings. And you want to know what it's hard to do? It's hard to touch the exact feeling that a person is experiencing. That's hard to do. And here's something else you need to realize. If I don't somehow tap into that feeling within three tries, guess what happens? Communication is shut down. It's just that simple. But here's what's wonderful. There's four large categories of feelings. Mad, sad, glad, I bet you think the fourth one's going to rhyme, but it doesn't. Fear. Those are the four major categories of all feelings. As long as I can tap into the right area, within just a few sentences, I can almost get to the exact emotion. You know that? So it's not a matter of necessarily getting everything perfectly right and tapping the exact emotion that that individual is experiencing. Are there a wide range of anger? Did Jesus ever get angry? If you'd seen Jesus in the temple after He cleansed it, you might have walked out on the street and said, Man, Jesus, you are a little bit angry, weren't you? And you'd have tapped into the feeling, wouldn't you? And guess what he might tell you? Yeah, I was angry, but that was righteous indignation. Right? And that's a whole different kind of anger than just rage against another because of hatred that you might have for that person. But they both fall in the category of what? Of anger, don't they? Now, I like to try to get individuals to practice tapping into feelings. So listen to this. Here's a young boy. He's just started taking guitar lessons. And he says this to his mom. Mom, I practice all the time, every day for an hour. And I've been doing this for six months. And it just doesn't make any difference. And you know what mama says? Johnny, don't you know you're a lot better than you were when you started long ago? You didn't know any chords before, and now you know two. Boy, that makes Johnny feel good, because all the kids back in class know 50. Don't say that to him. What's he experiencing? What's the feeling? Discouragement? Helplessness? I practice, I practice, I practice, and I just don't get any better. Tap the feeling to that boy. How about this one? I know I shouldn't have slammed the door, but she shouldn't have said that to me. Two feelings that are expressed in that one sentence. I'm going to give you time to think. I know you're waiting for me to put the answer up, aren't you? How about this? Guilty? I know I shouldn't have done that, right? That's guilty. I shouldn't have done that. But, isn't there a little justification in there too? But, 
She shouldn't have said that to me. Now, if I'm a parent, I'm going to tap into both of those feelings. Aren't I? I'm going to try my best to. How about this one? Do you think I did the right thing? Isn't that amazing? Here's somebody done something. Now they're asking you, did I do the right thing? What's the, what's the emotion? They're unsure, aren't they? I don't know whether I really did the right thing or not. Here's one. And this is a hard one, folks. I don't really know what I'm supposed to be feeling right now. Has anybody ever said that when the death of a loved one transpires? Absolutely. They know maybe how they're supposed to be feeling, and yet they're not feeling that way. In fact, they may be feeling something totally different than what they think they ought to be feeling. I don't know what I'm supposed to be feeling right now. Guess what it is? They're confused. Aren't they? I need to tap into the emotion. How about this one? This comes from personal experience. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Every other girl has a date but me. Kids can say that, can't they? What's the emotion? Alone? Left out? Cheated? Oh, you'll get a date one of these days, darling. You're a beautiful little girl. You'll grow out of this fat spell. That's, that's, that's mamas and daddies. You don't say that kind of stuff, folks. Goodness gracious. Tap into the feelings of that little girl. Now, before we leave this concept of listening, I want you to think about perception for just a minute. Okay? Perception is this, that which is taken into the mind for understanding. Okay? Here's what's interesting. Two people can be looking at exactly the same thing and yet both of them be looking at something totally different. Isn't that amazing? It can happen, can't it? Here's an illustration. Here's an individual, and he's looking at the Washington Monument. And he's talking to another person. And he tells the individual, yeah, this thing is beautiful. It has at least two sides. And guess what the other person says? Yep, it has two sides. And guess what? It's got a pointed top. Yep, sure has a pointed top. And guess what? Up at the top, it looks like there might be some windows up there. Yeah, there's some windows up there. And then he says this. That thing sure is tall. Person says, tall? I don't know if that thing's tall or not. Yeah, and how do you like all those flags that are around it? Flags? What flags are around it? And there's people down there staring up, looking at it. There's no people down there. Now remember, they're supposed to be looking at the exact same monument. But look at what the other one sees. All he sees is the top of that. They're, st they're both looking at the Washington Monument. And there's some things they see exactly alike, don't they? But there's some things... Because they see different things, they don't perceive it in the same way. We've got to help the other person see what I'm seeing. And they need to help me see what they're seeing. You want to know what the trouble is between races and cultures? It's this very thing right here. People perceive one way, other people perceive it a totally different way. And we got to sit down and talk to one another until we're seeing this identically. When you and I are in a discussion with our mate and all of a sudden the discussion begins to turn sour, you need to stop and you need to ask yourselves, are we looking at this problem the same way one with another? Because if not, it can cause some major problems. Now, that's a whole hour. Just don't be in her. We... we, we you, I got 25 slides on speaking to each other. No, I'm kidding. Let's talk about speaking. What we say and how we say it, folks, is vital, isn't it? It's of vital importance. Let me give you an example. What if a wife came to her husband and she asked this, Do I look fat in this dress? Uh-oh. Guys, let me tell you something. 
What you say and how you say it makes a difference, doesn't it? Anybody remember that commercial about oh honest Abraham Lincoln? His wife walks in and guess what she says? Hey Abe, do I look fat in this dress? Now remember, he's what? He's honest Abe, isn't he? Man, he starts squinting, he starts squirming. And he finally goes like this. Well, maybe a little. Oh, she came unglued. Unglued. What you say and how you communicate things is important, folks. We're going to do two things. Number one, I'm going to give you seven basic rules of speaking. And I'm going to give you eight rules of don'ts. And then we'll be done very quickly. How about this? Pick a spot and a time free of distractions. Like we said a while ago, when your husband's watching a ball game, it may not be the best time to talk about the budget. A husband comes in, he needs to talk to his wife about something. And guess what? She's cooking, she's trying to get the kids cleaned up, she's trying to get homework done. It's not the best time to talk, is it? You get you a destination free of all distractions. Now here's something that's interesting. When you pick a place to talk about something, you make that your talk place. and that's So in other words, the bedroom is out. That's not where you go to talk. The living room, that's supposed to be a family room, is it not? That may not be the best place to talk because sometimes in those discussions, things happen, don't they? Emotions are expressed. You need a neutral place in your home where you can talk to one another so that the other places can continue to be great places in your home. How about this next one? Make certain the discussion matters. It is the man's job to take out the trash. Right? I learned that way back yonder. Our trash gets picked up every Friday. And guess what? Kathleen wants that big green thing out on the road. What if I leave one morning and I forget to put that big green trash can out there? And she comes out. She, ugh, that goof. He didn't take the trash out. So guess what she has to do? She has to go get the green trash can, roll it down there to the street. She jumps in her car. Do you know you forgot the trash can? Are you kidding me? Does it matter? Does it, re does it really matter? You see, make certain that what you're really going to talk about and deal with matters in the relationship. Guess what's going to happen? That husband will come home that night and that can's going to be out there empty now. And you know what he's going to say? Oh, I forgot to take the trash out. He knows what he's supposed to do. He just forgot. Leave the man alone. Now the same thing can go true with the husband, can it? Make certain that what you've got to talk about really, really matters in the relationship. Because sometimes the things we talk about and argue about and fight about, it doesn't make a hill of beans difference, you know it? How about this one? Speak up. My son, I don't know where he got it. He mumbles. He drives me bonkers, man. Michael, speak up. Tell me what you're going to say, son. He's gotten better now that he's a manager. But man, there's the longest time you didn't know what, he's, what the word he's saying. So speak up. Nothing wrong with that. I didn't say yell. I said speak up. Stay on topic. Boy, there's a hard one for some people. You know what? Guys, if you've got one thing you need to talk about, guess what? Let's talk about one thing. We're not here to talk about 20 things tonight. We're here to talk about one thing. And don't let one thing turn into two things or three things. You stay focused on the topic you need to talk about. Be clear. You ever heard somebody who can't be clear? Drive you bonkers, won't it? I don't know why you did that. What's that? That's not very clear. You shouldn't do that. Well, what, what's that? Be clear in what you're talking about. How about this one? Be kind. 
The Bible teaches kindness, doesn't it? Ephesians 4.32, be ye kind to another. The second element of love is, guess what? Being kind. Charity suffereth long and is kind. There's two elderly individuals and they've been married for about 70 years and somebody came to the old man and he says, what's the secret of marriage? He says, I'll tell you what the secret of marriage is. You're not going to like it very much because it's not profound. He says, be kind to each other. Isn't that something? Sometimes we're not very kind to the very person we're supposed to love and care most about. How about this one? Keep your emotions in check. Keep your emotions in check. Is it possible to be angry and yet not be yelling and screaming and cussing? Is it possible to do that? My wife and I used to work at the children's home in Paragould, Arkansas. We were house parents there. Let me tell you something. Some of them kids, they can make you mad as a wet hen. You know that? I mean mad. But guess what you can't do? You can't just explode on those kids. But you know what I can do? I can't sit that kid down. I can tell him this. Now let me tell you something. I am mad as I can be right now at you. Now I, I'm not cussing him. I'm not screaming at him. But guess what he knows? He knows I'm upset. And we can do that. We have total control of our emotions. Did you know that? Guess where emotions come from? They come from the brain, don't they? Every emotion originates in the brain. And I have full control of my brain. I just have to stop and use it sometimes. See, anger can be brought under control. Be angry and what? Sin not. See, we all know the passage, don't we? Seven rules of speaking. Now let's talk about some things that you don't want to do when you're talking to one another. See, we, this could be a whole other hour or two lesson, could it not? Number one, don't put down and demean. Don't do that. Respect each other. Hold one another up in high esteem. Honor one another. Even when you're talking about problems to one another. You're just an old deadbeat. You're just lazy as you can be. Don't be doing all that stuff. Secondly, don't use you statements. Oh, those right there drive me bonkers. You. You always turn the TV up too loud. You always have to be right, don't you? You think you know everything. Oh, you, you, you. Guys, get the you's out of your language, okay? And that leads to the other one. Don't use extended exaggerations. Always, never, you never care about me, never. Now, ne now never is a big word, isn't it? You know, that about 41 years ago, I stepped up there on the altar and said, I do, Did I, I didn't care about you then. No, you never cared about me. Get those big words like that, always, never out of your vocabulary. How about this one? Don't yell and scream and don't curse, folks. The Bible tells us that we are to put away all filthy communication from out of our mouth. Our mates and our loved ones should never be cursed by us. And that's hard sometimes, isn't it? Especially if they're cursing at us. It's not always easy to do. How about this next one? Don't constantly bring up the mistakes and the mishaps of the past. You don't have to do that. Deal with what? I'm dealing with one problem right now. Don't bring up all the past. See, that's where the what is. That's where the history is, isn't it? How about this next? Don't repeat things over and over and over. My wife's good at that. She can tell me something in 25 times. You know that? I go, man, I thought I just heard that. I should only have to say it what? Once. And if the person has any intelligence whatsoever, hopefully he gets it, right? I don't have to hear it a thousand times. Or this one, don't be over dramatic. Can we be that way? Oh yes, it's easy to get over dramatic about something. Or this one, don't act like the know-it-all. 
And I wish we had time just to go and just take each one of those and talk about them in depth. Seven rules to do, eight things not to do. Guys, communication is going to happen in relationships. And it doesn't matter whether you say a word or don't say a word. You're going to communicate with other people. You know that? And it's one of the most difficult skills to master. I'll guarantee you. Here's what I wish some of you would do. Okay, he told me to repeat back to another person exactly what they say. So all day tomorrow, every person I first come in contact with, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to repeat back to them what they say to me. You come back here tomorrow night and you tell me how difficult that was to do all day long. You may do it once. You may do it twice. But I'll guarantee you, you won't do it all day long. You know it? It's hard. It's difficult. And guess what? It takes a lot of time. But if we don't learn the skills of communication, guess what? We're going to continue to have a lot of problems in our home. That last point. Many, many marriages have come to an end in divorce because two grown adults can't communicate with one another. Somewhere we need a school or we need something, don't we? To start teaching some of these principles at one year old, two years old, three years old, four years old, don't we? Because what do they say? It's hard to teach an old dog, new tricks, it's tough. It's tough. We may mention earlier that the one thing all of us must do is learn how to hear God's Word, mustn't we? How many times have you tried to teach somebody the Bible and rather than them listening to what it says, they just get angry, don't they? They just get angry. And what if they would just repeat back what God had said to them? He that believeth... And is baptized, saved, Mark 16, 16. Wow. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, just because I repeat that back to you and I let you know I've heard that, it doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with everything you've told me. It just means that I what? That I heard you. And I'll guarantee you when it comes to the Word of God, folks, we must learn to hear. Do you need to obey the gospel tonight? I taught this little girl once about Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. She got mad every time we talked about it. About two years later, she called me up. Mr. Victor, Mr. Victor, I was baptized today. I said, really? That is fantastic. She said, did you know in Mark 16, 16, it says, He that believes is baptized shall be saved. I said, no, I didn't know that. I don't know what finally clicked, but something finally clicked. And she obeyed the gospel. There were two individuals who were going to hold a debate. A Baptist preacher and a member of the church. The gospel preacher. The gospel preacher got sick the day of the debate. Oh, man. The topic of discussion was the necessity of baptism and salvation. What are we going to do? This debate's been planned for six months or more. The venue's been secured. All the announcements have gone out. We can't just cancel the debate. Old elder raised his hand and said, I'll debate him. Night of the debate came, and he had the very first speech. And he was supposed to prove that baptism is necessary for salvation. He stood up, he opened his Bible, and he says, Mark 16, 16 says, He that believeth, and is baptized, shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. He closed his Bible. He says, I now yield the rest of my time to my opponent. Well, the opponent now had about 18 minutes of his time plus 20 minutes of his own time. And he got up there and he rat and he raved for almost 40 minutes. And it was time for the old elder to stand up again. And he got back in the pulpit and he says this. My Bible still has Mark 16, 16 in it. And it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I yield my time to my opponent. 
Folks, the Word of God doesn't change. Maybe you're an erring Christian. My friends, the Bible tells us if we'll confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The same blood that cleansed us to make us a Christian continues in our lives and cleanses us from our sins as children of God. You need to respond to the invitation. Won't you come as we stand and sing? <clears throat> message on communication um, uh, y'all be careful on your way home the wet weather and uh, the wet roads uh, we have the further announcements uh, we'll have brother Walter Young uh, lead us in a closing prayer <coughs> I love being a Christian don't you I enjoy this life Let's pray for a moment. Our Father, our God in heaven, holy is your name. Thank you so very much for the privilege to be a part of the kingdom. Thank you also, most of all, for your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has made it possible. Blessed be your name, Father, and blessed be his name forever. We thank you so much for the kingdom. Continue to increase and bless her. Show kindness to her and continue to grant her favor. Thank you so much for this time that we've spent to learn about your word and to learn how to live life with our spouses and with communication among ourselves and others. Thanks again for the privilege to be able to learn your word and to be able to put it in practice. Continue to forgive us of our sins and help us to go before you and walk righteously in doing those things that you would have us to do. We ask that you continue to look on us for good and help us to forgive others as well as our own selves. Grant us favor in your sight. Go with us now as we travel to our homes and continue to 
Bless us that we may be a blessing. Help us that we may be a help. And grant us favor that we may be a solution in life. Thanks again for Brother Victor Askew. Continue to bless him that he may do those things that are pleasing also in your sight. Thank you so much again for this time that we're able to spend. Look on us for good and grant us favor. Keep your good hand on us that we may continue to do your will. These and all other blessings that you see the need, we're humbly begging, giving thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for all things. Amen. Thank you.